to the Proceedings Podcast. This is day three in Hook 24 in Reno at the Grand Sierra. And my uh, guest today is the Air Boss, Vice Admiral Dan Cheever, call sign UNDRA, which we all love. Um, <laughs> it's true. He, he is a career F-18 pilot. He commanded an F-18 squadron. He's a Top Gun grad and a Top Gun instructor. He commanded a carrier air wing and then uh, carrier strike group four. Uh, and and I'm a, an alumni of Carrier Strike Group. I know that. Yep. When it used to be called Strike Force Training Atlantic. Exactly. Yep. Um, but uh, anyway, I love that tour, and congrats yeah. on on having that job, sir. Thank you. And uh, you've been in the job as the Air Boss now for about a year, maybe a little less. Uh, than a this year? is starting seventh month. Okay. Well, yep. you were held up. That's right. Yeah. So we had a couple acting in there yeah. who yeah. were awesome. So George Wyckoff, who you know from Fifth Fleet. Right, I met him last year. Completely awesome. And yeah. we interviewed last year, the air boss was still Admiral Weitzel. Kenny Weitzel, yeah. Um, but then there was an interim period there with the, the holdup of hey, the flag and general officer. Which was actually neat because I got a chance to meet all these great industry partners yep. and see everything for myself uh, while I was waiting the job. So I really got to learn a lot. Nice. It was really good, nice. a, a good education for me. Okay, so in your first year as the air boss, uh, all things naval aviation. What are your top maybe three or four priorities? And then talk about what's going well and okay. where the challenges are, the friction points. Yeah, so the top priority by far is the warfighting piece. To get to the high-end warfighting, no kidding, full mission capable aircraft, aircraft carriers, so we can bring the fight to anybody uh, who needs it. Um, the second biggest priority is safety. So we've set a goal to reduce safety mishaps by 50% year after year. Okay. So far in this uh, year, after about six months of that effort, we've reduced uh, the mishaps by about 27%. So we're not hitting the goal, but we're on that journey, and yep. we're just going to continue on that journey. Glide slope down. Yep. yep. And then the final one that I think about a lot because I had a sailor uh, son that served, and now he's doing the GI Bill, and I have a, a Marine Corps son, first lieutenant, who serves currently. Nice. The treatment of our young folks and how we, how we make this a great experience for them which I think will help recruiting and retention across the board. So I'm, I'm focused on that as well. Okay. I'm going to take a sidebar because mm -hmm. uh, you, when you brought that up, I immediately thought of the Ike deployment of Chowder yeah. Hill, <laughs> uh, how the, I mean, that seemed unusual and wonderful, yeah. how, uh, what a forward posture uh, the Ike strike group had in terms of social media, in terms of getting the message out. Right. Um, is that something that we can expect more of in uh, future carrier strike groups as they as they go forward? I think so. That was sort of an unusual situation because we were living in that uh, ballistic missile, cruise missile, and unmanned systems threat yeah. all the time. They were on the line for 205 days. That's a long time. That's a long time in to the, be under in that. The WES, yeah. uh, in that WES. Yeah. So anybody who says you can't live under a WES, you absolutely can, and you can survive and fight. Yep and do the fun stuff that they were doing on the Ike. They had Wi-Fi. They had, you know, he was giving out the cookies to the to the right. warrior of the day and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's just a really positive story, I think, for where we're going. Um, now you have to control those emissions, you know, from yeah, time to time, but it's it's really working well. Yeah, that's great. And and Chowda, he was a skipper for me when I was CAG. Oh, is he, that right? He's awesome. He's, he's from Boston. He is. He, he's Quincy, just a, Quincy Mass. Quincy, he's a great guy. So uh, the demand signal for carriers and carrier air wings is really high right now. Right? Very popular. Yeah, very popular. <laughs> so you had the Ford get extended yep. on her maiden deployment. You had the Ike get extended. That became an, a nine-month deployment. Um, how are you managing the, the need to uh, maintain the force, yep. right, to uh, build the readiness but also meet the demand signal? Yeah, so it's a really a good dialogue between uh, OSD and the big Navy. Uh, to describe, hey, here's the impacts if we extend. Yep. Real world gets a vote, and they have to make decisions, but here's the real world impacts to that. And so it's a dialogue back and forth. It's not the easiest thing to manage in the world, and there are impacts to extending things. Uh, but that's why we call the carrier strike groups indispensable, because those carriers, they just bring so much power, so much capability, integrated deterrence. You know, So it's really the preserve the peace, respond in the crisis, and win decisively in combat. So it brings all that just with itself, sure. and it's sovereign, nobody else permission, and that kind of stuff. So it's really powerful. Yeah, but all those points uh, Admiral Paparo made in his July proceedings yep. article, carriers still indispensable. He's right? amazing, and he's here. And he's here, yep. um, so he'll be the speaker tonight. Yeah. Uh, 
But, you know, so and Admiral Kaler's here and Admiral Caudill's here, which is a testament to this get together with industry and all our junior officers Pack and the fleet team. and uh, fleet forces, fleet forces, a right, right. So, uh, but a little bit more, I want to dig on on mm -hmm. carrier maintenance and getting carriers yep. in and out of the the yards, the availabilities on time. How's that going? So we're on that journey. Um, we have some successes. Uh, we just got the Nimitz out a day early of their assigned maintenance period, which is okay. sort of a new, yep. really good uh, behavior. Uh, we're working on all the yards to make sure we can scale that across to everybody. But it's a journey in different places, different touch labor, all that kind of stuff. So we're on that journey. Um, I met with Jim Downey, NAVC, and the team uh, to set some uh, North Stars is what we call them, the yep. big goals of getting back to the, you know, how long that maintenance period should be and what does it take to get there. And so it's really good behavior. It fits into our get real, get better, perform to plan, exactly where the CNO and the rest of the leadership's taken us. Okay, so Nimitz came out of the of an availability a day ahead of a bit, uh, ahead of schedule. Yep, that's better. You know, it, it's that's, better. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, John sees Dennis. We're working to get her out, and then uh, the Ike's coming in. So, talk of, uh, for a minute about some of the lessons from the Ike Strike Group uh, deployment. There was a debrief yesterday. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of firsts that Admiral Niguez yeah. and his team talked about. You know, a number of weapons that were used in combat first time, mm -hmm. came off the rails, performed according to, uh, to plan. They did what they were supposed to do. Um, and, and I think somebody, one of the taglines that came out of that was that pulling the trigger is really good for morale. A firm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway from that is the junior officers on the panel that are so incredible, so impressive. And that, that's who we have as our leadership in the future. We're in a really good spot. Then you look at Stem Miguez as the striker admiral. Uh, you look at Starvin as the CAG. That whole leadership team, it's just impressive. Uh, and the fact that they maintain their resiliency, their morale throughout, for everybody, fairly easy for trigger pullers and people who are used, you, like us, are, we're used to living in a weapons engagement envelope. But think of a young kid out of high school, they're 19 years old, and they kept their morale high as well. That's impressive to me. Yeah, so the uh, re-enlistment rate for the, the, the crew, the way airline, up. everybody? Way good. up. Good. Right. That's, yeah. that's good news. Yeah, and they, you know, it, they really were, are a great team. And then right after them, Theodore Roosevelt Strike Group came in, picked up right where they were. And this whole time, they're innovating, learning, accelerating. I mean, we're doing in days now what used to take months, and I'm talking just you know, prior to this deployment. Yep. And it's just accelerating rapidly. Now the Abraham uh, Lincoln Strike Group is in there doing the same thing. So lessons from that deployment, coming back quickly, uh, infiltrating into the weapon schools, the oh, training yeah. pipeline, into Carrier Strike Group 4 and 15. You know, what, what are some of those... Really high priority things that were that happened for Ike that immediately turned into the, the new evolutions in Com 2X or in Test of Fab, those kinds of things. Right. So Harry S. Truman's right now going through Com 2X out there. All these lessons learned are in that training period. The weapons tactics instructors have taken this and put it in each weapons school's curriculum for how they teach. Wow. And they're also teaching. The, what we've always taught, which is you got to learn fast and you got to innovate fast and you, you got to learn during the combat because there's always fog and you learn every time you go to combat. So they're learning quick and it's okay. really impressive. Uh, the last two years when I talked to Admiral Weitzel, uh, we always talked about aircraft readiness and mm -hmm. the, his, you know, he would mention the North Star. I think it was uh, 370 or so up yep. Super Hornets. Um, how is aircraft readiness these days? Still at 80% or roughly 80% for the Super yeah. Hornets? So it was 341 was 340. the big North Star okay. goal, and we're beyond that on a daily basis. So now it's the now that we have that readiness uh, for mission-capable rates, we're really getting after full mission-capable rates to make sure every system yeah. works exactly how it should. Uh, and that's the journey we're on. And that's, that's a really good journey. We're really making progress, and I credit a lot of that, actually all of that, to Kenny to bullet before him, uh, and to Chebs at Nav Air. Chebs is really helping us advance that ball fast, uh, and, and it's a good partnership. How about with uh, the fifth gen as uh, F-35 comes online, yep. and now I think up to four or so um, fleet squadrons that mm -hmm. have got the F-35 and working into deployments and stuff. 
Is uh, our MC and FMC rates as expected for that new airplane? They are. They're, we're just right at that cusp of the mission capable rates. And then, as you know, low observable is a tough thing for full mission capable rates. Uh, but we're on that journey, and I think we're going to get there soon. Uh, and we're excited as the uh, Lockheed Martin unwinds the F-35s that are coming to VF-86 okay. is the next one. So those jets are starting to fly out of Texas. Uh, with the new software and all that kind of stuff, further combat capability, it really unlocks that block four that you've heard about, that, yep. that kind of uh, technology. Maintaining the low observable materials when you're on the difficult environment of yeah. you know, salt air on the carrier, jet exhaust and all that stuff, how's that going? It's surprisingly better than we thought it might be, huh. uh, but all of us who've been around for a long time know that the longer you're in that sea air environment, the more you have to take care of them for the long term. Yep. So right now in the short term, we're doing great. We're looking at the long term to make sure we're grooming them and keeping them up and ready the whole time. So that's the that's the journey and it's a, it's a good one. And Air Force has been really willing to share all their lessons learned over the low observable journey. So Got we it. really appreciate that work. Okay, that's good. Uh, on the people side, yeah, uh, a lot on you know, and this this that's my favorite side by the way. This this goes on now for five six years. Uh, pilot JO pilot retention department mm -hmm. head, uh, you know, folks taking the department head jobs um, lower than where you've wanted it to be, and your predecessors wanted it to be. Do you see any improvements? coming and, and what actions are you taking to, to make the improvements? So I think we're going to see improvements. The, the bonuses and those things, we always work those. Uh, I think it's really about the experience. Are we challenging these young folks, giving them the leeway to make decisions and then putting meaningful work in front of them? That's really the trick to me. Um, so we're getting after that. I think we're going to do well. Uh, I think this generation is really committed uh, and they just want to be challenged and given the freedom to do what they're supposed to do, especially the warfighting piece. That resonates. So I think the Ike deployment, TR, Abe, Ford, all of them will resonate with this young crowd uh, and will keep the most talented folks in, okay. which is really the key. Yeah, so I, I interviewed Admiral Brophy, uh, yeah. uh, air training, two days ago. Snap. And he mentioned you know, getting down to or, or increasing the pilot production uh, cycle and, and going up to 105% and uh, winnowing down that backlog yep. of the ensigns and JGs that are waiting to start, all that stuff. Um, he mentioned no longer going to the to the boat for CQ in the training command aircraft, and that's speeding up a little bit on the production side. That wasn't designed to speed it up. That was just designed uh, based on the precision landing modes. Yep. And the fact that we didn't have to do that, and it was safe to do that, but not designed necessarily to speed it up because okay. it's only a couple of days for the CQ evolution. Yeah, they yeah. still do all the landing practices. Right, right. And then uh, yesterday, Dragon Finley talked about at, you know, the, the, the West Coast uh, FRS CO, and she said yeah. that uh, she's done now, I think, three CQ debts yep. um, with those pilots who came uh, and, and did not CQ in the, in the training command. And she said, no changes. It's a lower attrition rate than we had before, so it's, it's going really well. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, talk a minute about unmanned. So yeah. for quite a while now, we've been anticipating MQ-25 coming into the fleet, that unmanned tanker that may have other capabilities in the future, but for the immediate yeah. the goal is to get more gas in the air without putting it on the rhinos, yep. right? Uh, when do you expect the first MQ-25 that will make a deployment with an air wing? as an yeah. integrated asset. So the, the journey we're on right now is to get that thing flying in 25, that's how I'm pressurizing the system, okay. and then to get it on a carrier to do the manned unmanned teaming in 26 to make sure that we're ready to deploy it safely. And I think we're gonna get there. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of people coming together, the Boeing industry, the rest of it, to come together to really make this thing work. The MQ-8, which my aide flew, uh, is sundowning. Uh, and that gave us 10 years of good learning on manned, on manned teaming on the DDGs and the cruisers. Yep. And that's really good learning. We're going to scale that learning into the MQ-25 on the big decks. And then once you get it on the big decks, then we'll be able to prove the manned, on manned teaming on carriers. And that unlocks the future of potential CCAs and other things that you might get into. Uh, and I think it's going to be really powerful because I really want to get those strike fighter folks back into strike fighter 
and less tank. Okay. So, C and that's going to... Uh, you, you use that acronym, CCAs. What is that? Uh, collaborative Combat Aircraft. Oh, okay. So it's the Got future it. unmanned systems Got of, uh, you know, so it's a sort of a exploring space. Yeah. R&D, hey, yeah. what is that going to be and, and what's there? But I think for us, MQ-25 is going to be the gateway to that. We already have MQ-4 that flies in the Indo-Pacific oh. and in Europe theater. So that's the Triton. Triton. Land-based. Yeah, uh, land-based. Partnering with P-8s. Yeah, so the whole anti-submarine, surface warfare stuff that they do amazingly Maritime, well. Maritime, ISR, all that. Yep. Yep. It's, okay. it's powerful. So we've, we've already proven the man-on-man -man teaming from the shore piece. Now it's the man-on-man -man teaming big aircraft or other aircraft on the flight deck. Okay. And that's we're excited to get there. And I'm how, really excited to get the M25. Yeah. How many uh, Tritons are now in the fleet, and and how many more do you expect to deliver in the next year or two? Yeah, so we're in the uh, got like four out there and three out there, and we're increasing that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we'll just keep increasing it as we go, and we'll stand up more orbits and that kind of stuff. So it's pretty exciting. That that learning, I've actually flown out there and seen it in Italy. I got to cut the ribbon on the on the, the first Triton thing out there. So flying out of Signella? Signella, okay. yeah. And, and in the Pacific, out of Guam? Out of Guam. Uh, and you have a lot of capability to go other places and, and really operate that thing throughout the theater. Nice. And it's powerful. So And that's a, that's a quick learning environment, too, as you know, uh, doing yeah. all those intelligence pieces. Cool. Uh, any saved rounds? Uh, thanks for what you do. Uh, it's great to be here at Hook this year. The key to Hook is that the junior officers come here, get with industry, and tell them what do they like, what do they not like, and sometimes without even an extra contract or anything, the engineers who are here and the folks that represent industry can fix things for the junior officer Nice. that in a bureaucracy might take a lot longer, yep. and it's really good behavior. Of course, we bring in our heroes. So Rice Williams is here. Yeah. He's the guy that kept I, the secret for 50 years. Met him last night. Oh, right. amazing. Right. Yeah, so we bring in all those heroes, and then we recognize the entire Naval Aviation team, supporters, families, a lot of families here. Yep. And it's just an exciting event. And this is the first year at the Grand Sierra Resort, which is really exciting. Great yeah. venue and a great partnership. Well, Naval Institute loves to be here. Uh, it's good to do a couple of episodes of the podcast, you know, in, in person. Yeah. Um, and oh, so, can I mention yes, one sir? more? Absolutely. So at the Na uh, National Naval Aviation Museum, there's a new exhibit. It's the Top Gun uh, exhibit, and it's a real powerful exhibit for what Top Gun's done since 1969 cool. uh, to advance us. And it really represents all our warfighting centers uh, and weapons tactics instructors to do what they do. Nice. I'll have to get down there. It's haven't, awesome. I haven't been to the Naval Aviation Museum in years. I've got to get down to Pensacola and check that yeah, one out. It's good. Sterles right. is running it down there, and it's really awesome. Good. Just like the Midway and good. the rest. Yeah, it's All right. good. Well, my guest has been Vice Admiral Undra Cheever. Undra Cheever. The Air Boss, the Commander of Naval Air Forces and Commander of Naval Air Forces Pacific. Yep. Sir, uh, thanks for taking the time today to stop by our booth and uh, you know talk to our listeners and, awesome. and viewers. Uh, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much. Good to see you again. All right. That wraps up our last episode from uh, Hook 24. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.